Welcome to Circuit Launch. Um, this venue has been graciously provided by Circuit Launch. They are a hardware co-working space. Um, so if you have any friends who are actually interested in building a hardware startup, um, they're actually doing some great stuff here. Um, I am Jonathan Nelson. I am the founder and chief talking officer of Hackers and Founders. Um, we host a lot of events in and around Silicon Valley. Um, a lot has been happening on the crypto space. And so we're going to be having a number of events this next, um, now the next couple of years, um, excuse me, the next couple of months on crypto and blockchain and that sort of stuff. Um, we also, as part of what we do, is we help companies land in Silicon Valley from overseas. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, we've just run into problems with entrepreneurs at our events and problems, you know, how do I land in Silicon Valley? How do I handle legal? Oh my God, I'm getting deported. Um, holy crap, they're going to break the internet. Um, net neutrality, so forth, that sort of stuff. So we get involved in some fairly interesting discussions. Um, we have a program in Latin America for companies scaling across the Spanish-speaking world. Um, we are starting a similar program in um, Berlin. Um, the regulatory issues there are actually slowing us down a little bit. Um, but I want to welcome you guys. Um, we tend to be pretty laid back at Hackers and Founders. If you guys have any questions, just raise your hands. Do that. Um, we've assembled some great speakers for you guys this afternoon. Um, some of the smartest people that I actually know in this space. I mean, that's saying something because I've I have about like 15,000 Gmail contacts at this point in time, after I've been running one of this town's largest networking events for a decade. Um, I want to talk about what we're doing at Hackers and Founders. Um, and this talk is called Hard Forking Venture Capital. Um, and, voila. Aha. I was raised the only white child at the end of six hours of dirt road in rural Honduras. It sounds like a terrible joke, um, but it's actually the truth. Um, this is actually the adobe house where I grew up in um, the first four years of my life. Mom and dad were missionaries, um, and we lived in Honduras from 19... I was there until 1978. Then we went to this crappy little country that no one had ever heard of in 1978 called Costa Rica. Um, lived there for the first ten years of my life. I thought it was normal that people actually rode sea turtles because that's kind of what the park rangers wanted you to do. The cute little blonde kid, come here, photo, you know. Um, anyway, um, Costa Rica was in a currency crisis at the time. The exchange rate went from eight colonies to a dollar to 160 colonies to the dollar. And so that just makes an impression on you growing up. Um, I moved to the United States um, when I was 14. I really wanted to major in computer science. Dad thought that computers were video game machines back in 1990. They said, son, you should do something to help other people. You should be a nurse, like your mom. It was really helpful when we were in the middle of the jungle and your mom knew how to, you know, treat malaria. I'm like, okay, Dad. I don't really have the legs for it and the white male on the itchy, but okay, I guess I'll be a nurse. Um, so I became a nurse. I did that for about 20 years. Um, I finally decided to go back to school for Mountain View. And four nights a week, I started having events. Can you guys see that screen okay? Should we lower the lights over here? Is that possible? Um, anyway, so we started having events in Silicon Valley um, as a way for me to actually just get to know some people. And our first event was five people and me in a bar. Um, our next event was eight people and me in a bar. Next was 13. Next was 23. Um, in 2010, 2011, there were a lot of underemployed nerds um, building startups. And so we started expanding globally. Hackers and Founders events have now been held in 125 cities around the world. A couple hundred thousand people have attended um, Hackers and Founders events. And so we have been kind of at the cutting edge of this global explosion of technology startups, not just here, um, but in places like Togo, um, places like Venezuela. Um, our chapter uh, head in Venezuela actually got back to me a couple of months ago and said, hey, we're gonna actually put our events on hiatus. I'm like, oh, why is that? He's like, well, it normally takes me 30 minutes to get home from the venue. Last night, it took me three and a half hours. I'm like, wow, why? He's like, well, I was dodging burning tires and burning cars. Um, <laughs> just like, oh my gosh, <laughs> are you guys okay? He's like, yeah, you know, our community is really strong. My passion is to actually teach people how to build startups so that when the shit show that happens and the government finally settles down, we can actually rebuild the economy based on technology companies. And so 
that is what we've been doing. Um, we help a number of those companies land in Silicon Valley. Um, we started what I believe is Silicon Valley's first founders cooperative. Um, startups pay stock into a shared equity pool. Um, they become part owners of the pool. We'll own part of the pool. We sell part of the pool to pay our bills. And we've worked with 55 startups. Those startups in aggregate are worth about $600 million now. Um, they've raised about $100 million. Um, we've had seven exits out of our portfolio out of the last five years. Um, and our investors have actually been doing about 30% year over year for five years running. I was completely shocked um, because I did not realize that the average VC firm um, does about 5% per year for their investors. Um, there's some weird little mechanics there. Um, so like this dude who used to be a nurse who's now a startup guy who's been kind of obsessing about finance problems for startups ends up I guess doing something pretty cool. And then I told you I got involved with some really weird government stuff, right? Um, how many has everybody, how many has ever tried to raise capital for a startup? How many of you enjoyed it? <laughs> no one, me neither. Um, and I've just, like I'm sick and tired of, you know, going to a bar and having a pint with people and having people talk about the challenges that they actually have in raising capital. And so when this thing called the Jobs Act and crowdfunding came along, we submitted 80 pages of comments to the SEC on what that should look like to benefit thousands of two and three person startups around the globe. Apparently not a whole lot of people in the world understand the problems of thousands of technology startups. So Commissioner Stein at the SEC said, Jonathan, that was really cool. <clears throat> Would you like to join an advisory committee on capital formation for small businesses? And I was like, okay. Um, you realize that three years ago I was wiping butts for a living, right? Um, saving lives, of course, I was an ER nurse. Um, and so the last two years, I've served on an SEC committee on capital formation. I'm the only guy with a ponytail in the building. Um, I had a suit made. It's, it has not killed me yet um, to actually wear this suit when I'm in Washington, D.C. But one of the problems that we've talked about over and over and over again was this problem of how do I get money to startups? How do I actually get raise money for my small business? Fine, if we actually let thousands, 100,000 people invest small amounts of money into startups, how do they get their money back out? Venture capitalists are professionals at this. They only do 5% a year. Why else are they, you know, why would anybody else want to invest in the asset class? It's terrible. Um, and we actually kind of worked on some really interesting, really interesting questions popped up. Um, one of the reasons why is because of exits, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Silicon Valley is kind of the center of the world when it comes to getting money to businesses. Um, this year alone, there's gonna be about $30 billion invested into startups um, in our neighborhood, essentially from San Francisco to Oakland to San Jose, 30 billion bucks. Um, and over the last 70 years, we have been the world center of startup finance and the add up all of the stock of all of the companies in Silicon Valley, that ends up adding up to $4 trillion, which is equal to 15% of all of the United States' stock is here in this town, and 5% of the value of all of the world's stock is in this town. And so you have some really, really interesting things. We have this amazing concentration of capital in Silicon Valley. We have a large concentration of big tech companies, and big tech companies are kind of these giant unicorns. They go around, they eat other startups, and then they poop gold into the ecosystem, and that gold makes investors happy, makes the angels happy, makes the founders richer, and then lets everybody finally join the middle class and lets them buy a house in Palo Alto for $2 million. Congratulations, you're a millionaire. You can now afford a down payment on a condo in Menlo Park or San Jose or wherever that is. And, but the problem is, is if you're in the middle of the country and if you have a company, like where the hell do you go to actually raise money? Uh, this is why Trump got elected, was because the money actually exists and it's very concentrated at the coast. Um, so William Gibson had this Stop, um, being a nerd, I love cyberpunk. Um, the future is already here, it's just not very evenly distributed. William Gibson was the father of the cyberpunk kind of genre. 
Um, if I may be so bold, Jonathan Nelson's corollary to William Gibson's statement is the capital is already here, it's just not very evenly distributed. Why is that? This is not just kind of an abstract problem for me. This is a challenge that I've dealt with every week for the last decade. One of the most frequent pains in the ass, most frequent things that sucks for founders is how do I actually raise money? If you, and your chances of raising capital are pretty much exponentially decay out of Silicon Valley, the farthest that you actually get from Silicon Valley, the harder it is gonna be to raise capital. Um, a friend of mine from Uruguay is here. You know, how much venture capital gets invested into Uruguay on a yearly basis? Like, nothing. Maybe a little bit, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars, maybe a couple million dollars. Um, there's some amazing engineers in Uruguay doing some really cool things. Um, at the same time, how do we actually get capital to these companies? How do we invest profitably into these companies? And it comes down to the actual mechanics. The engineer inside of me just kind of nerds out about this problem. I you know, grew up in a currency crisis. You're a software engineer and you're a nurse, so you think about systems and ecosystems. And I love systems, and so I'm kind of obsessed about this problem. Why is this, why is the capital so concentrated in Silicon Valley? How does this capital thing actually work? And the challenge is, is our system of how we actually invest in startups, I think is fundamentally broken in most of the world. At very least, there are some very, very big bugs in the system. Why is that? The way that we actually invest in companies is you have a startup, I'm gonna buy stock in your company. My money is now frozen inside of your company until you give me a chance to sell that stock again. When does that happen? When the Google acquires your company or when you IPO your company on the NASDAQ. Those are really the only two ways that an investor makes money when they invest into businesses. And so you need to a path to be able to unfreeze that money. Now, we talked about $30 billion of capital in Silicon Valley this year, $4 trillion in startup stock. All of those are technology companies, and all of those are companies that actually acquire other startups. In fact, 85% of all of the mergers and acquisitions in the world, in the world of technology, happen within 60 miles. And it generally happens through someone that you know. So, unless you know people, your chance of actually having an exit and unfreezing your investors' money is essentially really close to nil. Um, and this is actually, I think, one of the biggest economic problems in our world right now, is this lack of liquidity. If we had more exits, if we had more ways to actually sell stock or let investors sell their stock in your company again a second time, I think that we could actually help more money flow into parts of like, you know, underserviced startup hubs like Chicago um, or Guadalajara or Uruguay. Um, we're all software engineers, or at least know a couple. Um, and in the blockchain space, in, in open source world, there's this concept of a fork. You know, we all share our intellectual property together. We all believe in collaborative economics. We all, you know, we share code. We all benefit from this common shared code base. And every now and then, I, nerds, we get a little religious about some of our technologies, right? Apple versus PC, this is a techno-religious holy war, right? VI versus Emacs, techno-religious holy wars. We can sometimes get a little intense about our passions, about our beliefs. And occasionally when that happens, we end up having not the Protestant Reformation where the Protestants veer away from the Catholics, but we have, I don't know, um, was there ever a fork? Yeah, how many Linux operating systems are there right now? They're like the Protestants. <laughs> when we all you know, left the one true BSD way back when, we kept on forking and forking and forking, creating our own little kind of denominations. And these forks, sometimes when we say, screw you, I'm never gonna go back, I'm never gonna merge my code base with yours again, I believe philosophically different things about technology than you, and so I'm just gonna hard fork this code base. I think it's time that we actually hard fork venture capital to actually solve the problems, and frankly, this is what I'm doing. How do we actually do that? I believe that we need fundamentally a new type of venture fund. I think that we actually need venture funds, 
where stock can actually be bought and sold and traded on online exchanges. This completely changed, this little mechanic will completely change the economics of an actual venture fund. If you think about it, I'm, Torrance is managing a pension fund. I have a venture fund, I say, Torrance, would you like to invest in my venture fund? He's like, oh, sure. I'll write you $100 million, and then in 10 years, when all of your portfolio companies exit, you pay me back some money. Yes, awesome. Torrance invests in my venture fund. What if Torrance could invest in my venture fund, and if three years in, maybe he's an engineer, and maybe he says, hey, I got three grand I'd like to actually put into a venture fund, but at some point, I'm gonna to wanna to join the Silicon Valley middle class and put a down payment on like a one bedroom studio in San Francisco, so I'm gonna to need to actually get this money back out. What if we could give Torrance a way to essentially sell his stock in the fund? Kind of like a little mini mutual fund or an ETF for startup stock. I believe that in the standard model of venture capital, really only works when I raise a bunch of money from a bunch of rich people, families, pension funds, what have you, I make 100 investments or 50 investments into companies, and I hope to God that some of these actually turn into unicorns. More often than not, we end up with like chihuahua corns. But just because I'm a chihuahua doesn't mean that I actually don't have value. What if I actually have employees? What if I'm actually profitable? Why would you want to build a profitable company in Silicon Valley, Jonathan? We don't do that. That's crazy. No, 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 no. Like, I want to grow. Like, I think we're going to grow 50% or 100% this year. Well, Jonathan, that's not enough. In Silicon Valley, you're only sexy. If you can grow 20% every week, when you're hitting those numbers, come back to me. In my mind, this is absolutely madness. These are fantastic companies that are actually growing, that are profitable, that are producing revenue. You know what? Some people like chihuahuas, some people like burros, they don't all have to be a unicorn. What if we could essentially invest into a portfolio of companies and have these portfolio companies valued by a third party and have that audited? And then the investors in the venture fund could buy, sell, and trade the stock based on that reporting. All of a sudden, as a fund manager, I'm not looking for the difference between a chihuahua and a unicorn. I'm actually looking for which technology company is likely to grow 50% a year over the next four or five years. This is an infinitely easier decision to actually make than to guess who is the Google gonna acquire in a decade for a billion dollars, or who is gonna be able to IPO for a billion, one billion dollars in a year. Actually building profitable companies that produce revenue becomes a good thing if you have a liquid fund. You know, an interesting case study um, for us is Latin America. Having grown up in Central America, speaking Spanish fluently, cult I'm culturally fluent, um, it's kind of a passion of mine. Latin America is an $8 trillion economy. $8 trillion of the world speaks Spanish. That is 10% of the world's entire economy. It's actually, if you add Brazil in there, it's about the same size as the Chinese economy. China, tons of capital, one market. VCs are like, oh my God, China. Um, we have to raise, you know, we have to, you know, invest in companies in China. Whereas Latin America, on an annual basis, it receives about $500 million a year in angel, venture, and private equity combined. Like, Angel and venture are a small part of this whole private equity category. <laughs> in Silicon Valley, just the angel and venture is $30 billion. Latin America is 500 million if you add private equity combined into there. It is crazy. Why do these countries end up staying poor? Because their companies actually can't get any investment. Why does nobody invest into Latin America? Well, I saw Narcos, Jonathan. There's a lot of cocaine down there. Great show, by the way but I'm not gonna invest down there. What they don't see is that it's 10% of the world's economy, and you know what? There's a lot of people in Latin America that have nothing to do with the cocaine industry, right? In fact, most of them don't. Most of them are highly educated professionals that are actually busy working for banks, working for technology companies, what have you, but there's a chronic lack of capital in Latin America. You'll see the same problems in other parts of the world like Eastern Europe you'll see the same challenges in parts of, well, hell, Europe in general. 
um, Africa, South Asia, the vast majority of the world that's not in Silicon Valley is undercapitalized to the similar extent. You know, I grew up in this weird part of the world and I grew up playing soccer with kids without shoes. Like my dream at one point was to actually move to Silicon Valley, learn how to flip a company to the Google for $10 million, and then not to become a Silicon Valley middle class and be a millionaire, but to actually be able to retire early and go back down to Costa Rica or Central America where you could live for, I don't know, a year, a century on you know $3 million and essentially retire early and I don't know, let's figure out how to get shoes on little kids. How do you actually solve something like poverty? If you actually think about it, um, poor people just need a better economy around them, right? They need, parents need jobs. When parents have good jobs, they can buy their kids shoes. How do we get parents good jobs? I don't know, we need companies that don't suck, companies that are growing. How do we get companies that don't suck and that are growing? Well, let's get them capital. What if we can actually come up with a different way to get capital to these countries and not have to worry about exits? I believe that liquid venture funds can actually, eventually, solve poverty. Um, and that's really what we're doing at Hackers and Founders. Not just to be kind of this hippie kumbaya, let's actually save the world thing, um, but you know, we've been doing 30% year over year for our investors. There is a good chance to actually do well, as well as do good in the world, and I profoundly believe that. Um, so we've launched. Um, two weeks ago, we launched in Mexico. We're live. If you actually go to hackersandfounders.cx, hf.cx, um, you can actually click through and go to our website. You can read the white paper. Um, unfortunately, because SEC, you, um, if unless you are a Silicon Valley middle class and you are a millionaire, you cannot invest. Um, we can't invest. Anybody else in the world can pretty much invest. It costs me the same amount to bring on an investor for a dollar as it does bring on an investor for a million dollars because this is software and this is the future of crowdfunding. Um, unfortunately, that just is the way it is. I think that we need to lobby for these laws to change in the United States so that we can also not just invest in emerging markets, but we can actually also invest into you know, underserved poor parts of the world like Chicago or Des Moines or Wyoming. Um, my family lives in northern Minnesota. The biggest problem they have is all the young people are leaving. Where do they go? To the cities and to the, to the cities and to the coast because that's where the money is. Why is that? Because there's liquidity out here. So that's what we're doing. Questions? Comments? Concerns? What is it like raising capital in Japan, Singapore, or in other developed economies like that? I hear, the, I hear many of the same complaints. Singapore is interesting because they've actually had a government program. If you have a startup, they will give you, if I'm not mistaken, $100,000, and they will match your external funding like two or three to one. Um, so Singapore has become something of a startup hub. Um, Japan, they actually do have a pretty active stock market. Um, unfortunately, standard deal terms in Japan and Tokyo, from what I understand, was all invest, you know, two hundred thousand dollars into your company, and I would like forty or fifty percent of your company, please. Um, so the deal terms are pretty outrageous um, compared to Silicon Valley, and as such, there aren't as many startups that are actually happening there. They do exist. You do have large tech companies that are actually acquiring startups. Um, at the same time, I, I don't know if it's culturally appropriate or not, I, there's not a whole lot of Japanese startups that think globally, they tend to kind of think of the Japanese market. Um, and that's just what I've come across in terms of Japanese entrepreneurs. And, and so it becomes kind of an inward looking market as opposed to others. But there is a decent venture capital community in Japan because of it. Yeah, and they recently did, they have approved like 12 exchanges in like the last month or something like that. They're moving very aggressively to that. Uh, other countries like Dubai 
um, are moving fairly aggressively. Sweden, Switzerland, um, Gibraltar, Isle of Man. A lot of these other economies have a vested interest in, pff, let's get capital. Um, the United States, the finance lobby is one of the strongest. And so it's just going to be slower moving here. how the cryptocurrency itself works and how HackerCoin actually works. Um, it's actually really a painfully simple um, kind of low-hanging fruit uses of a blockchain stock. Um, essentially, we're just using a token as a digital stock certificate. Everybody in the United States is like, oh my god, is it a security? Yes, we are issuing a security. It is a digital stock certificate. And you know what, to be completely SEC compliant, um, you can't have any if you're not rich in the United States. Everybody else in the world can, unfortunately. And so we are actually just issuing and selling these digital stock certs or digital tokens at a buck a piece. Um, there's actually a 40% discount right now. But once we actually get going, we're gonna launch at a dollar a piece. And then after we're done with the sale, People will be able to buy, sell, and trade these in online exchanges. We haven't picked which ones yet. There'll be like, probably like four or five that we're gonna launch on. Um, and so the advantage of using kind of a blockchain backend is that you can actually own a digital something as opposed to the file sharing world where it's like, dude, I'm gonna give you a copy of like this sweet CD. Um, and you've copied it. In the blockchain world, I can actually give you something or we can trade you something and we can prove that each other own it. And so that's, that is the technology aspect of what it is that we're using. Long term, I think what the world needs is I think that we just need a global tokenized securities framework. Um, for my portfolio companies, I want all of them who have stock as digital tokens. And I want them to eventually be able to trade on online exchanges if and when they're actually ready to issue them. Um, at that point, I think the market for these stocks, these digital token stocks, becomes actually Trubal Global. And the problem of raising money in Japan just kind of goes away. You're raising money for a technology, and it's a global market instead of who do you know, who do you went to school with, that sort of stuff. So um, originally, really, Ethereum and smart contracts have been around for 20 months now. Um, and it's been kind of the ICO craze. People are launching a bunch of these things. Um, earlier this year, I was actually going to, um, getting ready to raise funds and started conversations to raise a publicly traded venture fund on the NASDAQ. Um, the cost it was going to cost me three to $5 million just to get this thing off the ground. Um, it was going to cost me about $2 million in legal and compliance. The companies that do this tend to charge at minimum 1000 bucks an hour um, because it's kind of a regulatory monopoly, oligopoly. Um, and so some friends actually started saying, dude, you're just overthinking this. You should just tokenize this. I'm like, what? And so I stopped. I took another long, hard look at the underlying technology. We talked to seven or eight different law firms, someone who served on the SEC committee with me, a, a dude who actually was a US attorney and brought the two first enforcement actions against crypto companies here in Silicon Valley. Um, he's now on the good side, I, whatever. Um, he's now actually runs the legal practice of Goodwin Proctor. Um, and so the technical innovation is really blockchain and smart contracts. Um, this, in my mind, is just kind of low-hanging fruit. And instead of a currency, we should just have a stock. Um, a lot of other people are actually issuing stocks but calling them utility tokens. I'm just like, well, screw it. Let's just build a stock. Like, this is the problem that I'm solving. Um, I, I agree that I, I think that corruption is a big problem. Capitalism is a system that really only works well if there isn't much corruption, because mm -hmm. then people get rewarded for their efforts. But at the moment, with the amount of data, um, that, uh, the, the amount of data that are being tracked, even in this country, um, the large corporations are tracking um, you know, startups and social startups and front running them and um, you know, uh, making it harder for us to compete. How would you, um, what would you suggest as a solution for companies in South America where you know, corruption is more um, 
pandemic, how would you prevent, what would you recommend those companies do uh, that are kind of clearly growing and being successful on the ground? How do you, how do you suggest they um, fly underneath the radar so that they don't get the kind of local sort of folks coming, uh, local authorities coming in, knocking on their door and getting a you know, an outrageous cut of the action and then basically putting competition at, at bay? The question is, is how do we actually solve corruption in countries with digital stocks tokens and kind of online trade, insider trading, front running, that sort of stuff, in emerging economies where we have a less of an established judicial system, essentially. Um, I think that that enforcement needs to be handled at the exchange level. Um, one of my dreams is I think we need to build a global token NASDAQ for securities. And I think that you actually need to have transparency and reporting that goes onto the exchange's blockchain so that everyone can actually see it. Um, you know, you should be able to connect your financials via API <laughs> to a tokenized exchange. Um, and that should be transparent or, you know, episodically every week kind of upload new financials so people can actually look at it much more fine print um, in a much more granular sort of way. Um, and then I think if there's bad actors, I think those companies need to be blacklisted, given a very big frowny face, and have that frowny face put on a blockchain. blockchain. And having those people who are involved put on the blockchain. Um, so I think we actually build trust via consensus and community as well. Um, running, an, running a physical community <laughs> of a couple hundred thousand people around the globe, I know that I serve the community. Like, I do not lead, I do not tell people, you must do this. Um, people are like, yeah, screw you, I'm gonna do my own thing, right? And we've done this in the world of technology for years. And so I would argue that the market, I would argue that kind of the distributed consensus of people buying and selling and trading on this thing would actually be a, as good a force for good and for compliance and for transparency as, for instance, an SEC. The SEC only has 2,500 people um, focused on law enforcement. And it's a $14 trillion securities market that they're policing. Like, there's a shit ton of shady stuff that goes around the edges because there just aren't that many police officers. What if we actually had not so many police officers, but just a bunch of watchdogs? That's kind of my take on it. What's the answer to, to making it available in the United States and not afraid of investment? Can you just follow the Title III How do we actually make this type of tokenized fund available to unaccredited investors in the United States is a question. So there is, I did about two years of legal research on that question, which is what would cost me about $5 million and to list it on the stock exchange. Um, there is a legal entity called a business development corporation. There have only been about 100, excuse me, they have about 100 of these created in the last couple of decades. Um, they have some unique characteristics, like anyone can invest, these things can trade on online exchanges. They have some really weird feature bugs that just required a lot of backflipping and twisting for us to kind of make it work for just a simple, straightforward thing that we were actually doing. Um, I believe that if we could actually lobby Congress and ask for maybe two pages of changes in the business development company laws, that we could actually use Reg A plus crowdfunding laws for this legal entity. Um, the problem is, is a company um, can raise under Title III, Reg A, Reg A plus, a company whose primary purpose is investing in other companies is known as an investment company, and there's an entire Securities Act devoted to that. It falls under REITs, mutual funds, ETFs, and so your legal expenses grow exponentially because of that. So what it would take is a couple of about a decade of lobbying is my guess. How, how would they shut you down if you just decided to do it in a transparent way through your token and then just deliver the value that you promised to people and it's backed up with open source code and discussion? What would they do? Like, would they come after you personally? Would they come after IQC or what, how would that? So what we're actually doing is all of our, you know, the parent company is offshore. Our bank is offshore. 
the transparency and all of that sort of stuff is going to be i'm going to be working as to make this as transparent as a publicly traded fund because i want to be a good actor and i want to do this and i'm more than happy to actually participate in the regulatory process i already have i've been on the sec committee for two years you know um what could they do we've talked long about that um the chances of uh, my going to jail or someone going to jail for securities fraud are you know it, that's when you lie you cheat you steal um you lie oh my god you're gonna make millions of dollars or oh my god you're gonna make seven percent a week on this investment like ponzi schemes are ponzi schemes fraud is fraud those are the things that people go to jail for um selling unregistered securities the sec has been kind of slapping people on the wrist i have a friend that the irs came and harassed him for six or eight months he left the country for a year <laughs> after that he shut his company down um so there are downsides. We have done as much as humanly possible to keep those downsides very low, and I'm actually very comfortable um, with our regular process, regulatory process for doing this. And we're having the checks built in the code into the anti-money laundering process, so you have to give a photo ID <laughs> to be able to buy our stock. Um, and then your photo ID is attached to your Ether wallet, and so the money laundering stuff is eh, not gonna really happen. Um, and at the same time, if you have an address inside of the continental United States, sorry. Um, so that's how we're approaching it. Um, long term, I think we're going to actually need to do some lobbying to actually change this. I think that we should create a lobby, a Bitcoin or crypto lobby. What it, the, the question was, was um, Ecuador launched its own digital currency a couple of years ago and it flopped. Why? Because it wasn't backed by a strong government's promise or wasn't backed by gold or silver. Um, <clears throat> you know, Venezuela is actually, they just announced last week that they're going to launch a petro currency, which is going to be backed by the price of oil. Um, you know, what is to prevent someone from backing a gold token by the price of gold, nothing. Um, I believe I actually came across a startup in Dubai that was actually starting to do that. Um, it, it's really just a matter of time before we take a lot of start of these real, real hard assets, real estate, gold, commodities, futures. In my mind, the future is all of that is gonna be part of this hard fork. We're hard forking the entire finance industry and eventually all of this stuff will be tokenized. Um, that's my opinion, and I think it's just a matter of time. Chris? Um, you mentioned uh, getting to a global security tokenized market. Um, do you have concerns with um, that transparency and also people losing privacy? And is that necessarily a bad thing? Do you think people should have privacy in their investments, or is it a feature that maybe helps prevent corruption um, if everyone knew where everyone was investing, where they had confidence in the system? So the question is if we have a global, uh, a global stock exchange where people don't have privacy, where you have to have a photo ID to, to your bank account and everyone can see how much is in your bank account. Um, in my mind, that's, a, that's gonna be a choice that people are actually gonna make. If you actually want a private account, you know, create 10 different companies and offshore entities and you know, create one in the Cayman Islands, British Virgin Islands, blah, 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 blah and have at the end of the chain create a wallet that actually has this. Where there's a will, there's a way. Frankly, I think it'll be easier at that point in time to just launder money through cash. <laughs> um, that's going to be a choice, and people will use either that as a feature or a bug. In our case, it just it has to be for us to be compliant. Why is there so much, the question is why is there so much 
fear, uncertainty, and doubt about this currency kind of taking down central banks. Um, what's that? It, it might be a good thing. Some people say that's a feature. Some people say that's a bug. It, the, the challenge is, and you know, there aren't a whole lot of people in Silicon Valley that are interested in engaging with government over the decades that it takes to actually move something in the government. Um, I'm one of the few investors in town that is actually in DC on a regular basis. Naval from AngelList lobbied a lot on the Jobs Act. I don't know of a whole lot of other people that are actively going there. Um, I think, having been a nurse for 20 years, I think the answer is you just you talk with the regulators <laughs> and you just say, hey, this is what we're doing. I mean, there's a reason why the song says I fought the law and the law won. Um, you know, it's possible to fight the law, it's possible to hack and move around the law. At the same time, the government is an organization whose two big kind of jobs are, one, to create a currency, a medium of exchange, and two, it collects taxes based on that currency that it issues. And so the reason why there's so much fun around this is because Bitcoin, and a lot of people in the community are like, screw the central bank. The problem is, is that you might actually attract the ire of the entire United States government. Eh, I'm less interested in that. Um, <laughs> that's a business risk that I'm not necessarily interested in tackling. I, I, I think, and it's one of the reasons why I think that we actually need to engage. It's one of the reasons why I think that we actually need to do a Bitcoin lobby. That's actually gonna be our next event in January is, um, government and crypto, um, and we're gonna bring in some people who are actually doing that, bring in some governments that are actually very forward thinking on this issue and why. Um, hopefully I'd love to get someone from DC here to do that. Um, but I think as, as a community, we've got to start exchanging. I think that we interchanging, I think we have to educate. Um, my experience dealing with the tech staffers of senators there are three engineers of all of the legislators in, Silicon, in DC, there are three engineers of all their staffers. There's probably tens of thousands of staffers to legislators in DC. Um, Zoe Lofgren, who has, ZJ Hull, is our staffer for Zoe Lofgren, who's our representative in San Jose. He's an engineer and he's freaking fantastic. Zoe Lofgren is freaking fantastic. But if another senator comes in from Kansas, their tech staffer tends to be the kid who was good at the Twitter during the campaign. Which is why when a telco comes and says, oh, this is going to break our internet and we have to pass, you know, net neutrality is evil, this is why these people believe them. Is because the kids were good at the Twitter and eh, I'm doing something for it. So I think we've got to actually start educating and engaging more forthrightly on a long basis. Last question. Do I really think it'll take 10 years to actually prove that this is a way to protect investors as opposed to have more risk? Uh, yeah. You know, I, I ended up in this weird position at Hackers and Founders where we're a meetup, we're events, and we help companies land here. We kind of have like this consulting for equity kind of business. We are now finally launching a fund because I feel like we can do a fund that's community first so that the community globally can actually participate. Um, my, I'm very, very passionate about protecting investors. I think that a best way to protect investors is low management fees. Um, that's, I mentioned that when I was in the SEC, I got a lot of dirty looks. Um, but, so I'm an index funds and ETF kind of guy in that respect. Um, and the problem with crowdfunding is as well, is that you really have to have discipline to build a portfolio of 20 to 25 companies 
before you hit one company that's going to have a huge return. Um, angel investors, when they invest their own money and they build that size portfolio, their returns tend to be about 25% a year, which is a fantastic asset class. In my mind, the difference between an angel investor who invests their own money and a venture capitalist who charges a management fee, which is 2% a year for a 10-year fund or 20%, if venture funds as an asset class do 5% per year, angels do 25% per year, why is there a 20% diff difference? I don't know, I used to wipe ass for a living, but maybe that management fee has something to do with it. <laughs> um, so what we're doing is every money, any money that we actually use for operations will be repaid at 5%. We'll borrow it from the fund and we will repay it for 5% interest out of the first sale of our stock, which cannot happen before four years. So the first money out that we actually sell in our stock goes back to the fund to repay what we use for operations. So I have a financial incentive to run a lean organization um, I'm not going to run it. I'm not going to have a Bentley or, you know, I might get a Tesla, um, but it'll be a, you know, three series. It won't be, you know, the Roadster. Um, and so, but yeah, I do think that all of this stuff, um, it was not intuitive and there's a lot of weight in New York and in DC that's actually pushing for that these things to actually move slowly. And the SEC's only incentive is to not screw things up and to not get hauled in front of Congress. So if they're gonna make a decision that's actually gonna get them hauled in front of Congress, they're gonna be really, really slow at that. And this is, I think, one of them. So that is it. I'm sorry that was our last question. We need to keep going.